Support the Amigos podcast on Patreon or PayPal and receive cool perks and rad swag. Visit our page at everythingamiga.com slash support. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today, Aaron, we're going to be talking about XCOM, Enemy Unknown UFO XCOM. Some combination of those words yes. in a blender. UFO, Enemy Unknown. This game comes to us from Amigos Game Selection Committee member, Chris Folds. The Chris Folds. Folds! Yes, yes. So thank you, Chris, for choosing that game for us this week. Um, Aaron... I don't understand the title of this game. Okay. Okay. UFO Enemy Unknown. All right. I know what the enemy is. It's the UFOs. Yeah. What does UFO stand for? Unidentified Flying Object. So just by sheer definition, it's an enemy unknown. How do we know it's an enemy? Because they're attacking Earth. But at that point, we know that they're our enemy. That's right. That's so why the enemy says, is known. That's why it's not called UFO Unknown. Because if they were, if we didn't know they were enemies, they would just drop that part. We know they're not happy or friendly because it'd be UFO friend unknown. Is this it's like a Rumsfeld unknown. thing? Is this like the known and the unknown? And no. what did we not know? Listen, they put it down here as easy as pie. Listen, stick with XCOM. XCOM that way you don't have to worry. You don't know title. what's going on. No, it's not. It doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> this tells you everything in the game. UFOs, they're in the game. Now, they're your enemy. But you don't know anything about your enemy. It makes it hazy and mysterious. And that makes it more enthralling to the player. Now, let me ask you a question. You um, you know a little bit about UFOs. Indeed. Yeah. Um, what do you think the chances are, if there are UFOs, if they are, in fact, our enemy? Um, it depends on who you ask. I'm you asking you. Well, I'll give you an example. I was at a talk given by the legendary Dr. Stanley Friedman. A uh, ufologist. Ah, uh, yes. Greetings, true believers. Yes. That guy. And, no. What? That's, that's Stan Lee. And uh, he did a book, which I had him sign for me, on the Betty, the Betty and Barney Hill affair, where these two were, they had missing time. Lost time. And through... Uh, Abduction. Going through um, um, hypno hypno hypnosis, mm -hmm. it was determined that they had been kidnapped by aliens. Right. Uh, and they had been probed and prodded and hassled and screwed with. So... Anyone that would do that, probably your enemy. Now, on the flip side, man will go out, will trank up an elephant or whatever, stick some electronics in that sucker, let him go. It's exactly the same thing, right? If you're the elephant, you go up to other elephants, and they're like, what the hell happened? You're like, listen, these weird unknown creatures took away my consciousness and then planted me with electronics that I can't understand. It's exactly. So I have a feeling the aliens are just like we are. They're learning. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, I know now you're a family man. That's true. You're in the family way, as they say. Yeah. Um, they say that, or did you just make that up <laughs> in a weird, awkward phrase? <laughs> Please go ahead, though. Keep on trucking. Before you were a family man, yeah. If uh, say you were up on the mountain, yeah, chilling, yeah. You got your smokes. You got your I whiskey. Do. I do. You got your all bourbon, Japan. Please bourbon. Okay. And also, it was a uh, it was a uh, pride. Okay. Yeah. All of a sudden, you see the lights. Start a flash, and yeah. you see the descent of the craft right outside your 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 home on Mud Mountain. Right. Okay, you you walk out the door. You're there on the porch, and the the hatch comes open. Okay, and the alien and the alien beckons to you. Okay, and just says just come. Yeah, would you go? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because what are you gonna do? Stop them? They've got a UFO. I'm an idiot watching pro wrestling drinking bourbon. Mm -hmm. I, what am I gonna do? I just go with them. Yeah. You know, so it's like a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy thing. You meet you meet an alien at a party and you just take off. My my thoughts on it are that if I go into the UFO and introduce them to my way of life, 
eventually they'll join me on the couch at Mud Mountain. We're going to watch wrestling and eat cheese whiz. That's the way we'll do it. And Maybe that's, you, how, that's how we win. That's Why true. isn't that in the game? That's true. Maybe after you tour the alien spaceship, you back into the alien yourself. You show them your world. You know, I wrote a screenplay one time. Really? Yeah, oh, I did. I can't believe this hasn't and come it's up funny, before. It's funny this comes up because the, it's called Universal Constants was the name of the screenplay. And it's, it takes place out in the sticks. It's funny. I, I didn't realize I'd end up living this screenplay. <laughs> it takes place out in the sticks where a UFO lands. And it the UFO comes down and it's there to figure out how humans operate, mm-hmm. you know. And it sees this hick in there drinking moonshine and watching pro wrestling and smoking uh, a, something, you know, and the aliens, uh, m- the alien's headquarters is on it is in his ear. You know, come on, we need a report. What's going on? And he's reporting this stuff. And the more he reports on it, the more he thinks it looks pretty good. And finally, at the end of it, he comes in. He scares off the hillbilly. Then he gets on the couch, throws away his communicator, starts watching wrestling and eating crackers. That's and that's the because it, uh, that stuff's universal. People that's, like to sit around and kill time. That's the that's kind of like Blade Runner, right? It's nothing like Blade Runner, no. Because you've got that. You uh, what? Maybe I don't. I, I don't really know what Blade Runner is. You don't, do you? No. It's nothing like that. No. It's, Those are replicants from Beyond the Moon. They're not reptiles. No. It's a different thing. Like you've Hillary never Clinton. seen a film, have you? Or read any sort of eight books on UFOs? I knew about Betty and Barney Hill. How? That's a good question. Maybe X Files. I watched X Files. Possibly. That's that's not really connected to. Blade I'm surprised Runner, you would have watched a show like that, given your uh, delicate constitution. This was during a time of my life. I think we talked about it before, where I was trying to not be scared by things. Mm-hmm. How'd that go? It didn't go well. Do you remember the episode about the family that was like the incestuous family? That was an excellent episode. Yeah, man, that was a really scary episode. Yeah, yeah. that scared the crap out of that me. Was and a then good when one. they drive off and that '50s music's playing. Yeah, yeah, that was a good episode. Mm-hmm. That was a good episode. That much said, this game. Aliens are treated like aggressors. Yes. You know, and so my thoughts on that is if they're coming out here to, to uh, kill us, we're screwed. They can come through We're not space. screwed because we've got XCOM on our side. Yeah, here. well. I like the fact that the, the all the world's governments fund this program. <laughs> this thing would be gone instantly. <laughs> We'd all be doomed. That's true. Our, I think our leaders would welcome our new alien yeah, overlords. That's right. All right, Aaron. Let's talk a little bit this week about what's been going on over at everythingamiga.com. Okay, yeah. Now, it's funny. I don't know if you noticed this, Boatster, but uh, uh, this week, the trailer dropped. That's what they say in the business. Mm-hmm. The industry. For the new Ghostbusters film. I think it's called Ghostbusters Afterlife. Okay. Did you see this? I, you know, they, I, It was all over the Discord today. Everybody you, was talking about it. I have not seen it yet. I knew it. Did you ever see the original Ghostbusters? Yes. That in itself stuff. I didn't see that until I was married to Eep. Right. Well, this is a true sequel. They sort of dis they sort of uh, disavow any connection with the all girl Ghostbusters that bombed a couple years ago. Uh, and from what you could gather in the trailer, uh, this takes place like twenty or thirty years after the second Ghostbusters, and it looks. It looks not funny. It looks mm-hmm. sort of serious, which means that that I don't know about this. Well, it's another it's another gritty, dark reimagining it's not of a super childhood. Gritty, but it, it and it's got the how do you measure things? Well, how do you measure a level of grit? Well, you have really? got true grit, mm-hmm. right? Eastwood, right? Then you got something like uh, you ever watch uh, uh, Alice, uh, the uh, show Kiss My Grits, somewhere in that ballpark. I don't know what that is. You never heard of, of Mel's Diner, Alice? No? You never heard of Flo? Flo Jello Rose? Yeah, from Progressive. No. Okay, moving on. Anyway, so all this goes on to the fact that this week, Dreamcatcher, and this had this couldn't be a coincidence, he has uh, focused his Sauron-like eye on Ghostbusters 2. Now, I think it's pretty well known by now to most people that listen to this show that I hated Ghostbusters You did not 2, care for it. Except for the hilarious opening where the Ghostbusters are on the birthday party. What about the hilarious music. closing where they're riding the Statue of Liberty, controlling it with an NES advantage? I hated that. It was so, so stupid. Even by Ghostbusters <laughs> standard, it was dumb. Uh, so, yeah, I hated this movie. But, uh, uh, still, if you're going to go after a sequel, I'd rather come after this than after the all-girl Ghostbusters, which was... I don't know. I'm not sure which was worse. I mean, I didn't like it either, so it's a toss-up. Uh, anyway, of course, you had to get some uh, sweet game action with Ghostbusters 2. Now, I've played this, 
And uh, it's a horrible opening sequence where you're lowered in the sewer. <laughs> Man, that's one of the hardest, most pain to butt sequences. Is it, is it another example of a, the people just never getting past that first level? Well, I mean, I got past it, but I didn't like it. And, mm. and of course, I was already playing something I didn't like anyway. So, uh, uh, and the dream catcher does his usual shtick here and goes in scene by scene and, and breaks it down, including dialogue and the whole nine yards. Uh, if you'll recall in the movie, there was this like sentient slime. Yeah. You know the big, uh, uh, huge picture of the guy, Vigo, whatever the big Yeah, piece. Vigo Mortensen. No. Uh, uh, anyway, the, a guy I worked with had that on his wall. The really? Big, yeah, and it always was lame. Yeah. I'd walk I, I, by and thought he was lame. I bet he was a hit with the ladies. He's married, so he must have done at least made, he wowed at least one girl. It only takes one. <laughs> That's true. You know? To be impressed with your Vigo Mortensen <laughs> picture. So if you're into Ghostbusters 2, <clears throat> God bless you, poor fella. Check out, or if you just want to laugh at Dreamcatcher's antics, uh, come and look at this. Also, he, as I recall, he released some uh, 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 accompanying YouTube uh, action for the Ghostbusters 2 on his channel. So always check out Dreamcatcher's channel. Always good for a lark. Awesome, awesome. All right, Aaron. Shall we go over to the world of Amiga News this week? Yes, let's just roll right over there, Bo. All right. Well, the gamble train has rolled up. And first stop is the Commodore Creative Competition 2020. (laughs) That's us, Al. (laughs) Creative. (laughs) This comes to us from uh, the fine folks over at Amiga Ireland. Every year at Amiga Ireland, I don't know if that's true, at least last year and this year, they do a, a competition, a mod competition, and a deep paint competition, and maybe even some other stuff too. I think it looks like they've got the categories listed here. There's a mod category, a pixel art category, a 3D ray tracing category. Ooh. Ooh. So uh, if you're at all interested in entering this, you can go over to AmigaUsers.ie and click on the link for the Commodore Creative Competition. Uh, and submit, and the fine folks in attendance over to Amiga Ireland will be able to vote on this. However, if you are not able to make it to Amiga Ireland and you tune in for the stream, we're going to have an unofficial uh, poll of winners over on our Twitch stream. So uh, if you can't make it over there, I'll try and, and bring this event to you and let you let you cast your ballot for what you think is the best. Now, as I recall last year, uh, you actually... Uh, broadcast some of the music and stuff. Was that, oh was yeah, that, and this and it year was, it was pretty good. This year it's going to be a million times better because oh, yeah? this year I'm bringing I'm bringing some real equipment. Earl and me we're we're knee deep in the weeds going through all all the equipment setup and stuff. So this year it's really going to be like you're there. Did I see one of those pieces of equipment earlier? You did. It's, good luck, pal. Hey man, I just unwrapped that thing. <laughs> hey, it's not me, my fault I can't you, operate let it ask yet. You a, let me ask you a question. Okay. Get, lay down with us again on what is the date for Amiga Ireland? So Amiga, because it's going to be streamed. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, Amiga Ireland is uh, January eighteenth, nineteenth, and twentieth. I believe. Let me check the. Let me check those dates real quick. Uh, it is the seventeenth, eighteenth, and nineteenth. So almost, Mostly the 17th almost and 18th. A, just a month, a little over a month away. That's oh right. Oh my gosh, are That's you excited? Right. For this I'm boat? very excited. I'm very excited. And uh, and so and as always, if you would like to uh, support Amiga Ireland coverage this year, you can help me out getting over there by going to Ireland.amigospodcast.com and uh, throwing throwing some bucks my way. I appreciate yeah. it. Good luck over there. All right, Aaron. Let's talk about the next story up there. Imperium Solo, Aaron. You talked about this briefly last week, but provided no succinct information about it. So <laughs> I'm glad to see you. See, that's that's my job. Yeah. <laughs> Just give up, put out questions and you go figure it out. <laughs> so why don't you talk a little bit more about this now that we've got a picture of it up here? Well, I can. I, here's my exact experience with this. Okay. I was on Facebook one day, and this dude's like, "Hey, hey, everyone." I take pre-orders on this gimmick that lets you use modern USB joysticks on your Amiga. Pfft. I went over and bought two. That's all I need to hear. Uh, the uh, uh, this guy has a bunch of different versions of this that fit the Atari ST, Amstrad, C64, Genesis, and the CD32. Uh, these are uh, and he's tried a bunch of sticks uh, and that have gotten have gotten them working, including uh, stuff that have that are wireless even. And so I, that's which is that's one hundred percent the reason I want one. They also support USB mice, and he's he can add different uh, options to it. You know, I mean, they look great. Mm-hmm. Now uh, I have not gotten one yet. They have not shipped uh, uh, yet. In fact, he hasn't even ta- fulfilled the pre-orders yet. We're all we did was sign up. 
Uh, but I think the response was really nice. Listen, I would, and I think I for the two of them shipped. I think I paid like fifty bucks, fifty or sixty, maybe sixty-five American U.S. greenbacks. Mm-hmm. So it's not expensive as far as Amiga stuff goes. It's super not expensive. Oh yeah. And if I can hook a a, a USB mount, listen, I love the tank mouse, I love the Amiga mouse. But we we both have tried to play games with these things. I, I think back to our various attempts at the Amiga thon. And it's hideous. It's very difficult to do, and especially it ruins when you the don't. Game. Yeah, yeah. When you don't have a large mousing surface, yeah, uh, using that tank mouse is a bit of a chore. Yeah, so. yeah. So, so hey, uh, as soon as these come in, I'll be, we'll be all up in them, won't mm-hmm. we, both? Now, you absolutely. You have been testing the uh, Super Nintendo gimmick that lets you hook a Super Nintendo. Yeah, no, I those you can't use wireless. And, I yeah, that. and I haven't been able to use it with the Amiga yet because I haven't yet. Had an Amiga that was able yeah. to play games, right? But the, so, the day is coming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, you have, did you use them with the, what? A, you did try them with something. Oh yeah, you? it works fine on the uh, the Atari. Yeah, and that's uh, wacky. I, I would never have thought that. Yeah. Aaron, I want to tell you about the magnets that have just come in. The magnets are here. The 2019 Patreon supporter magnets uh, come to us directly from Hawaii. Directly from our boy, Jonas, over there, getting it done once again for the third year in a row. Actually, he's been sending us magnets since almost the beginning. If you're in Hawaii or need someone to do some quality stuff, Jonas, he runs the shop. Yeah, yeah. He's a big deal. Absolutely. And he does top shelf work, so we fully endorse the usage of his. So we've got our uh, Amigos Game Selection Committee magnets in a round form. In the round. Yeah, in the round. Just like uh, Jeff Leppard. Yep. Uh, And Amigos Supporter 2019 magnets are there sporting Lionheart. The best. You can't get a better magnet. Right, right. There is no better magnet than Amigo Supporter Magnet with Lionheart. I love on it. Lionheart. He's awesome. Yeah, yeah. All right, moving on to the next story, Aaron. Let's talk about Southwest Amiga Group, aka Swag. All right. Okay. So Swag is uh, getting together an official Workbench 2020 tournament. Okay. This is where they are going to they're going to play some games. They're going to hand out some prizes, and they're voting for what games they would like to uh, to have in this tournament. Okay. Okay. So, uh, if you go over to Twitter and check out at Southwest Amiga, you can vote for your favorite. Actually, I think that this is a Twitter link that actually leads to the Facebook link. I didn't post the Facebook link here because Facebook links are weird on Gather. But anyway, uh, if you're a swag kind of guy, and I know there's tons of folks in the chat right now that are, uh, head on over there and you have some control over what games are going to be played over at swag. The official workbench Tournament? Yeah. Why is it called that? It's why do we call the show Amigos? Just rant. <laughs> it's, it's something to do with the Amiga. <laughs> I just mean, thought just wondering. Well, I'm looking at the options. I thought it was here. pretty self explanatory. So. These don't run out of workbench, is what, I'm, is what I'm saying. Everything runs out of workbench. Oh no, that's not true. Yeah. Not in the old days. Listen, man, I know something about the Amiga. And I'm, I'm looking at this uh, I'm looking at this list here. But well, these are some pretty good ones. Uh, looks like Micro Machines is in the lead. Gravity me, that's a, Force Two? Have we played that? I don't think so. You know, Pixels is the one that, that suggested that. Um, I Out of these, I would go for Worms Director's Cut any day of the week. It's the ultimate tournament game. I'm surprised that Cincy's not in here. I see Kickoff 2 represented. Mm-hmm. You know, I prefer Cincy myself. Yeah, yeah. Because I Kickoff 2, I had no idea what was happening. Well, it's, it, it was moved madness. so fast. It was yeah. madness. But of these, of these bunch here... I do like the idea of maybe some network. Oh, there's more. Yeah, there's more. Lotus 3 is there, but not Lotus 1 or 2. Weird. Yeah. Weird. Also a weird choice. And what does SWAS stand for? Sensible World of Soccer. Oh, pfft. Well, there it is. Yeah. There you go. That would go with that one, probably. Or, or Stunt Car Racer, also good. Knights of the Sky is good, too, but I don't know. That's kind of complex. I don't know anything about Knights of the Sky. It's a World War One flight sim. Oh, okay. Like a more like, advanced like, wings. Like wings. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, so... Uh, anyway, check that out if you're a swag guy. And with that, Aaron, that wraps up this week's Amiga News. There wasn't too much to talk about, so the gamble train is pulling away. Oh, too bad. <laughs> this is why. Get him out. Get the gamble train out of here. Let's All talk right. about this week's game, Aaron. XCOM. Or? UFO. Enemy Unknown. Now, you know, it's uh, uh, there. Yeah, show them, show them your box. So, we've got a box copy of this. This is the PAL version, of course, sent to us by none other than Rushi uh, from over in Germany. Uh, 
the tagline is Command Earth's Forces Against the Alien Terror. That's not nearly descriptive enough for what you do in this game. <laughs> they didn't have enough room on the box front and back to tell you what they need to do. So, <laughs> let's talk about this sucker. So, <coughs> first of all, in the Amiga, you've got three separate versions of this boat. Did you know that? I did not know that. you got your uh, AGA version. That one came out, I believe it was first. Then you have your ECS OCS version. Really? And, yeah. Oh, oh, yes. And then you have the uh, uh, CD32 Special Edition. Yeah. Okay, now, uh, this thing shipped on four discs. I actually uh, watched a video of a guy who played this off the discs. Let's get this all the way. Uh, let me tell you, every day, if you're an Amiga gamer, you should drop to your knees and thank whomever you pray to that WHD load exists. Mm. Because the amount of disc swapping in this, you had to be like a juggler or like Gambit. You know, you're throwing <laughs> these things around. It was unbelievable. Now, if you had, theoretically, if you had four external three and a half inch drives, could you eliminate disc swapping? Here's the problem with that. You would think, like for example, I have multiple external drives. As you, you do. Know. The problem is on the Amiga, and you wouldn't know this, but most of the time, the games won't let you use external discs. Mm. Because, in fact, some games, I remember distinctly having to unplug my external disc drive. Were they something. just so afraid you'd start copying that floppy? Well, I just it was it, it was copy protection based up, but a lot of them just did not support the extra disc drives. It was quite infuriating because mm. when I bought one back in the day, I was like, I'm good. Right. I wasn't good. Mm. I think I bought one specifically to play Body Blows without wanting to die. Mm -hmm. No help. Mm. So, anywho. <clears throat> um, this is a one-player, uh, I would say, simulation game here. And this was published by Microprose and developed... Uh, it, it was developed by an outfit called Mythos Games, sort of in conjunction with Microprose UK. Okay, Mythos actually did some stuff that we've actually talked about. They did Lords of Chaos and the expansion for Lords of Chaos. Uh, what was the expansion on, called? I don't remember. Do you? I, I, I was wondering if you had it on there. No. I didn't, I didn't know. They also did a game called Magic and Mayhem. And they, they did a game called um, um, Laser Squad. Okay. Now, I'd heard a lot about this Laser Squad because I believe when we played that on the ZX, they said Laser Squad was like of the better version of Lords of uh, Chaos, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, but And this uh, XCOM slash UFO was originally supposed to, they were working on this to be Laser Squad 2, effectively, before they it was fleshed out and turned into something for Microprose. Um, the, uh, the port to the Amiga was done by an outfit called Climax. Uh, the people that worked on this, you had Bob Kuhn, he coded it. He's the same fellow that did Dune 2, which a lot of people love. Mm -hmm. That was a nerve wracker, as I recall. So this guy is he's just he's just working on the port. He well, he worked on this particular he worked on this. It was ported by Climax, so I'm assuming these guys that ported it worked for him okay. or Microprose. Okay. Okay. Uh, you had also uh, uh, Scott Johnson worked on this. He actually worked on a lot of crazy stuff: at Christmas Lemmings, Colonization, Hired Guns. And then you had uh, the fellows that actually helped design the original games, uh, the Ga the Gollop boys, Julian and Nick Gollop, who were responsible for Lords of Chaos and Laser Squad. And the box art, and I'm assuming it's the box art you have, uh, was done by a fellow named Danny Flynn. Mm. The XCOM bar box art is much less cool looking, much less colorful, in my opinion. Uh, this also had a release for DOS and Windows. And I didn't even know this until I got watched the videos. This had a PlayStation release. Did you know this came out on a PlayStation? I had no idea. Wow. That's that seems crazy. Well, not really. There's a CD32 port. Well, I mean, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're when you're right. You're right. I can't say that. Um, so, what is XCOM? Well, it's a simple premise for a game that is unbelievably not simple. Uh, you are basically the director of a uh, an Earth-based defense and research uh, project, and you are tasked with protecting the Earth from an enemy attack from UFOs. Uh, on the CD32 version of this, uh, you get an, an actual intro. Did you watch, get a chance to watch a little intro? It's not anything major, but mm -hmm. it's a... You know, it's just your standard aliens attack intro. It's not, no big deal. Um, so, 
They were originally developing this uh, laser attack or laser squad two on the ST. So it's funny that this didn't get a port on the ST. So what do you do in this? Well, like I said, you control, gosh, a multitude of stuff. Let's just start small. The first thing you do when you play this game is you pl you've got a globe in front of you, and you have to lay down where you're going to have your first base. Okay, and the first base is is somewhat pre-built. Okay. So you put your you put your uh, base down. Now your base is responsible for, uh, of course, this is where you launch all your uh, exploration or your tactical. Your drones right? come from there. You also do your research there. You also will do autopsies and have captives there, and you also will ha you will have the other mundane stuff a base has, like place to sleep, place to buy stuff. Your scientists, scientists, out there. yeah, the whole nine yards. Um, this game really, it's almost, to me, it's like divided in, say, three or four different parts. You've got your base building, upkeep, and management. Okay, and that includes doing all the research. That includes all that stuff. Then you've also got your, uh, you've got a uh, sort of a uh, intercept part of the game where you send planes or uh, uh, into the air and you try to intercept the UFOs that's coming around. And then you've also got a a, uh, a capture mode where you find a down UFO or one that's landed. You try to get there and you try to uh, kill or capture the aliens or at least damage the aliens where you can capture them. And at that point, you can you can grab some stuff from them and you can also take their bodies or or their semi-conscious bodies, their unharmed bodies, back to your base where you can do autopsies. You have to learn about their weaknesses. Uh, it's a lot of game, isn't it, Bo? It is. There's, this is like six games in one, really. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on. So me and Boat sat down. Now we, we had a cup of coffee with this. Was it two years ago at the Amigathon? Mm -hmm. And when we played it there, we were scratching our heads in a vain attempt to understand. This is a not a game that is easy to just jump into. So I had to watch a couple of tutorials. Just to figure out what the hell was going on. Well, this is a game that came with a manual, unless you yeah. acquired it through nefarious means. I, d I actually did get it. I had to. And you, yeah. um, and it was very useful for me to just because the manual breaks down basically the first, the tutorial yeah. of what you need to do. And if you follow that, it makes sense. But if you're trying to do this on your own, it's very difficult. So how did you? Since you had the book here, mm -hmm. I didn't think about that. And even when I saw the box. What was your approach? And I'll tell you what the dumb guy does. How did oh, you... I started at the beginning of the book where they're like, no. here's what you need to do. And they take you through every single step. Right. So when you were playing, now what did you do? To explain oh, like a okay. typical PlayStation. Okay. okay. So what you do is, you know, when the game starts, you've got the world. They yeah. call it the geosphere. Okay. You Fancy. put, yeah, you use the arrows. The The way that you navigate the geosphere is a little bit clunky. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. It could have been easier. Yeah. They've got a, They've got a little... Areas you click on to move the geosphere around as opposed to just kind of drag and the geosphere right, with your hand. Right, right. Uh, you choose a place for a base. You put your base down. And then you have to manipulate the time or else you're going to be in for a long haul. Okay? So basically you can accelerate time in this game t to where interesting stuff happens. So what I did was I cranked up the time to one day and then immediately you, you, you sight a UFO. Okay? When you sight a UFO... You hit the intercept button, you choose your your aircraft to go and chase down this UFO, okay? So, when you come into contact with the UFO, uh, you don't see any of this. This is all very abstract. It's like pinpoints on a map. You see your little pinpoint and it's going towards the UFO pinpoint. Yeah. When you get close, there is a, I call it a mini game. It's not really... It's, it's not, it's, if, it's like... It's CinemaWare had a mini game that's even less playable yeah. than the mini games in CinemaWare. Exactly, games. it's like there is no play there. At right, all. you basically choose a strategy by which to pursue the UFO. So and there you is can, a strategy. Yeah, but, so you can either do a, a an aggressive attack, a standard attack. You can choose to withdraw. You have options. At some point, you're going to shoot down this UFO. <laughs> okay, the UFO is going to crash, and then you travel to the site of the crash. And that is where the next phase of the game begins, the battle arena. Right. Okay. So when you when you track a ship, and it, whether it crashes or sometimes they'll just land, mm -hmm. and you can go there, uh, then you go into this this battle arena area. Which what this is is a um, 
let's say, isometric top-down view of an area. Yeah. Sometimes it's a field. Sometimes it's a block. Sometimes it's it, it you know it's just a, a piece of of uh, a land. And your job is to move troops out and try to take out these aliens. The aliens are have probably at least every time I do it, they've already established themselves in different positions there. It's never like I never got to go to one where the aliens are all in their ship and just tumble in there and kick the crap out of them. Did you? Yeah. In oh, fact, really? I did, yeah. Okay. So these are all random encounters, okay? And sometimes the aliens will be outside their ship mulling around. Sometimes they'll be in their ship and you've got to go in their ship and you've got to do some damage. So um, but at any rate, this is where the strategy this is where the real game is. Like there, all these other surrounding things are, are are on the periphery. The meat of the game is tactical combat with statistics. Uh, you know, in, in this chessboard-like atmosphere. You know, you against the alien. So um, now, how do you do this? You you use menus. This is all a graphically driven game where you're clicking on icons. You're clicking on uh, places on the map to move, and you've got graphs that tell you vers different different statistics. So this is very similar to actually doing movement in a tabletop role playing game, where you have a, if you have something gridded out, you've got a set number of move points, you've got a set number of attack points, you've got different percentages that say you know if you're going to shoot quickly, that's going to be a, a higher percentage or a lower percentage than if you shoot, uh, you know, if you take your time. But if you take your time, it takes more action points. You're constantly making these decisions, all while the enemy, during their turn, is doing the same thing against you. This game, every, like, Boat nailed it, in my opinion. Every other part of this game is in support of this main part, in some way, big or small. Uh, the first, when I watched the tutorial, the first thing I, they had me do was go in and make uh, upgraded weapons and if, outfit my guys in a different way. And so, because you can get like grenades and missiles and missiles, that's a whole other crazy, that's another wacky thing you have to deal with. But w effectively what you're doing is, uh, is building up a fighting force uh, using uh, research and getting more money to build more bases and to get more guys and upgrade your ships, upgrade your ship's weapons so you can have something to go down and be more effective when you are in the melee part of the game. Now, I hate <clears throat> micromanagement, I hate managing uh, resources, and I hate uh, researching, and I hate all that, and building bases, I hate it all that. But that much said, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's bad, it's just not my bag. What I do like is the actual fighting part of this with a butt. So, for me, the other stuff is an end to justify the means, which I, which I means I get to go and shoot, shoot stuff and run around. The first big problem, aside from all the extra stuff you've got to do, is the way that the GUI set up when you're on the ground. This is your classic, like, uh, language-free game where everything's on yeah. symbols. Now, don't get me wrong. This is nowhere near as bad as Settlers, where it was completely obtuse and you couldn't figure out what was it's going on. It's not as bad, but it's still it's it it was frustrating uh, to, to to and moving around could have been easier mm -hmm. you know everything could have been easier now they did some stuff a lot of stuff right the way you can there's a button there are two buttons on your GUI to move up and down levels mm -hmm. to put the roofs back on stuff mm -hmm. to where because it's a cutaway yeah and there's not that many buttons too I think there's eight buttons and I would say 60% of them you can figure out what they do what and there's just so much stuff. It's a lot to learn. It's very intimidating. Well, it's not a game that you're going to pick up and be a master at in one day. That's true. Uh, <laughs> boy, you got that right. So, when we actually get into combat, I actually had a fighting chance. Okay? One thing I noticed is that the aliens, I swear to you, Boat, will cheat. Or the game, maybe you didn't have this, but I mean... You could walk right off your ship and instantly get shot and not see where the bullet came from. Right. Mm -hmm. That happened to me a bunch of times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and because this game runs, it's a lot like Champions or Mech Warrior. You're right when you said that. Uh, uh, it's all line of sight, and so there's a if you if your character is not in a position to have a line of sight with the alien, there is no alien. Mm -hmm. So it makes it frustrating mm -hmm. uh, to try to catch them. Uh, however, once you come to terms. With the movement of the troops, how turns work. <clears throat> like, it took me a while to understand how the buttons that pop up tell you when you, what shots you still have available to you. Um, and 
Once I understood that, it helped. Mm -hmm. That helped. Yeah. Because when me and you played it, we looked like a couple bumbling idiots. Well, yeah. Yeah. I I got a little better. I got got a lot. After I played through the tutorial (laughs) mission, I felt like I was not a master of this game, but I felt like I understood the mechanics. Yeah. I'm not there yet, but I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm working on it. I think there's a good game in here if you really are dedicated to spending the time on it. This is very much a 1.0 release of this type of game. This was really the first game of its type. And um, a lot of games use, you know, there. I mean, if, if you look at a modern day, like I had a look at, uh, Julian has done a, a new version of this. And I think it's called like Phoenix Point or something like that. And it's just insane. Everything is so much easier to, to do. Like you can hover over an enemy and you can target different parts of the, the alien's body. And as you move your mouse, you see the gauges go up and down for percentages and stuff like that. To me, this game is just, it's very much a game of its time. You know, this is before yeah. the art of the UI was mastered. To me, the biggest the biggest flaw with I don't have a problem with the line of sight stuff. In fact, you know that's that's how this game works. If you can see everything, there's not much. Yeah, challenge I, don't, there. I don't have a problem. It's just it, it can feel very cheap early. I mm-hmm. mean, in my opinion. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, the uh, I think that the the main <clears throat> thing that is lacking in this in this game is a is squad control. I want to be able to select four guys and have them all move together. I think you can, can't you? Can you if you can, that? I couldn't find it in the manual, and I was unable to do it. I, you know, in like I said, I want to be able to select four guys and say, "You guys all move in this direction as far as you can," because it's just such a drag to have to go and and move each guy independently, especially early on in the game when the action's not hot and heavy yet. Um, so, but other than that, I mean, this game does a lot of things right. Um, you know, you have to look at it as really being a trendsetter. I was reading something online. I guess four people were really responsible for coding this thing. Yeah. So it's it's a mammoth undertaking. It's funny. Sure. I was looking on uh, I was looking on uh, uh, one of the Amiga sites, and they had a little interview with uh, Julian, and he talked about how this game came to life. And I mentioned some of it earlier that they were working on Legend Squad Two. And Micros, Microprose was like, listen, we'd like to have something like this, but they want a big, big game, like a Civilization-type game. And so they went to the task of doing... They tried to figure out what to do. Well, they looked up UFO stuff, and they decided to go in that direction. And uh, uh, after a while, uh, Microprose didn't understand what they were up to, you know, and so they had to keep telling them what to do, and Microsoft kept putting, throwing their weight... Or Microprose kept throwing their weight around, and, and they added some stuff and took some stuff out... But eventually, the project almost got cut because Microprose made some cu- for some uh, cutbacks. Then there was some crazy stuff with Spectrum Holobyte uh, buying someone's shares. You know, company stuff that almost put the game in jeopardy. Mm-hmm. So the game was sort of uh, was sort of brewed up in sort of a tumultuous corporate time. And to think about it, because this game has made a boatload of money, no pun intended. And to think that this thing almost got the axe simply because people didn't understand what they were doing and the money wasn't there. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, it makes you wonder how many of these types of games... Never see the light of day. Yeah. You know, something else about this game, and when you mentioned that the guy had updated it, this is a game, we've talked this a few times on the Amiga. Some games on the Amiga, you, and not just the Amiga, by the way, on uh, every old machine. Some of these games you can fire right up and they play as great as they did. Usually actiony type games you're gonna say but games like this in my mind they suffer a lot worse f- from age because of things like the interface uh, because of things like weird controls or the way it's like they've well been. even i mean three words lack of tooltips yeah yeah that, that sums it all up I'm, yeah it, no you're dead on yeah. and or and really more help mm-hmm. more like in-game help right i mean this game has like a uh a lot of online help, but it's more like gameplay help, not help a beginner know what's happening type mm-hmm. help. You know, and, and there's a lot. This game has a lot to offer because parts of this game that I didn't get to sounded awesome. Capturing aliens, interrogating them, dissecting them, mm-hmm. all the crazy stuff that the government would do, doing stuff to get more money from these countries. But I mean, it was all so far over my head. I felt like I was swimming in a just a sea of despair trying to get through this thing. And I'm not gonna some of these games are gonna be like, yeah, I didn't like it, I didn't get it, I'm gonna I'm gonna downplay it. It's I think it's a definitely a quality game. It's definitely something that 
broke some trends and broke the mold a little bit, but I mean, it's a game of its era. And as an added bonus, and I think you'll agree with me on this, I want to talk about this, we ended up playing this on the, we played the AGA version and we also played the PC version, the DOS version. I happen to have a DOS Pentium machine sitting right beside the Amiga, and me and Boat were there uh, Monday, and we played both at the same time, didn't we? And one thing I will say is that they look pretty similar. The PC had a little higher res, but it wasn't like, it made, that wasn't a big deal. And they sounded pretty similar, no problems there, but there was one major difference. The PC was so much smoother mm-hmm. and, and easier to move around in. It yeah. was so and, much and easier. And this is a game where it's one of those games where, depending on the CPU that you have, I mean, if you think about a Pentium versus, you know, the uh, the 68,000, I mean, there's no comparison. There's no comparison. Well, it depends on which... See, if you have a... Like a, a Pentium 1 compared to any any Amiga well, chipset. Well, an Amiga... Like, if you had an 060 or something, you're you're right up in there. Well, yeah, if you had an 060. But I mean, if you're again, one of the three people like, that had an 060. That's my point. That's my point. And no, I mean, this is more relevant now than it was then. You know right. what I mean? Because a lot more people have that stuff now than they did then. But it is, just so you know, if you are playing this and you are frustrated by the speed, um, just know that if you if you do get a faster computer, you will have a more enjoyable experience with it. Yeah, and I, I heard a lot of people say that they had... They had emulated this and just cranked up the computer. That's the, what I did. Yeah, That's what I did. So I know I played it on the actual 1200 and emulated and on DOS and the DOS. The DOS, hey, this is what this reminds me of Syndicate. Uh, we had a very similar situation where Syndicate didn't uh, run didn't run that great. I don't know. It I don't. I don't. So much better on the on the DOS. Yeah, I machine. think I think the looks were more. I mean, the looks were a bigger factor with Syndicate than the speed. I can tell you one thing: if you're playing this off floppies. God help you, because mm-hmm. it is a. It, it, I saw when I was because I was using Amiga Forever playing yeah. this, and I saw those little lights light up underneath each one of the discs. Yeah, and... yeah, it's it's crazy. Uh, this game, of course, went on to be have uh, an expansion. It had sequels. Uh, believe it or not, this thing uh, spawned novelizations. Did wow, you know that? I had no idea. I can see it though. This kind of stuff is ripe for that kind yeah. of thing. You know, is th- this game? This type of game reminds me a lot of uh, the tactics games that came out much later, like Final Fantasy Tactics. And I'm not, I just don't have that kind of a strategic mindset where I can position my troops on the field and think six moves ahead. I just. You're like me. You've been playing, we're, we're twitchy guys yeah. from way back. It's to me, it, it just starts seeming too much like work. And then I'm like, boy, I'm playing a game and I'm, I'm doing this work. But I respect everything that this game tried to do. And the scope is just incredible. Well, for a certain, you know, for a certain, and I usually give a disclaimer before we do games like this, where, where I can only, I only comment on what I saw and what I did. Mm-hmm. Okay, and there's a lot I didn't touch. For a certain um, type of gamer, sort of like the same thing we said when we played timelines and stuff. This is right up your alley. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And yes, it runs, it runs a little dopey, but it's still playable. This is not like Wing Command on the six on the six hundred. Right. This is playable. Uh, and if you now, unless you've got a disk drive only, but I mean, it's not my it's not my cup of tea. It's just there's too much going on for me to handle. Um, <clears throat> I uh, looked at some reviews on this. Now, uh, you know, of course, as I mentioned, there are three different versions of this. You've got your uh, OCS, your AGA, and your C32. The, the, these scores are as you would expect. The Lemon guys give this an 8.6 on the OCS, 8.6 or 8.7, 8.65 on the AGA, and 8.61 on the CD32. So they're all about the same. Uh, Amiga Action uh, rated this a 9.2 out of 10. Wow. <clears throat> uh, Very high score. Amiga Format gave this 9 out of 10. Amiga Power, they were not so kind. Uh, they reviewed it twice. They gave it a uh, they gave it a, uh, a 3 point... What are these? It's where these decimals. 3.6 out of 10 and 6.6 out of 10. Maybe original <clears throat> re-release or maybe AGA now the a- and OCS. the AGA versions they were more kind to. They gave it a 7.5 out of 10. CU Amiga uh, liked it. They were giving it a, they gave it a 9 out of 10 and, and an 8.9 out of 10. And the one was giving it a, uh, sort of been the same ballpark, 7s and 8s. So across the board. So pretty, pretty popular. If you wanted to look this up online, I found the discs going for pretty cheap. I found the full game uh, AGA versions going for around thirty bucks. But I saw some of these going real high. Uh, so you're, it's one of those games where it's sort of all over the map. You know, depending. I on will what say, time you know, the, the the European box art is very attractive. 
uh, and it's very it's it's sort of cool. Um, it is nice. I yeah, love it. yeah. There's lots of things to look at. You know, when you first look at it, you see the big guy, but you look off in the distance. There's the cool. You see the guys coming out of the ship and stuff. So does the manual have the same picture on the it? The manual's all black and white. It's, oh yeah. It's, yeah so it's, the rest of it's got kind of a plane. Yeah, yeah. But the the cover itself, there's not a whole lot of cool it feelings is nice, or anything yeah. here. I like it when we have the box. We don't talk about that stuff enough. You know, this is probably the first game since we did the Colin uh, Curly Quavers game. That we've actually had the box yeah, for. Yeah. Hey, yeah. we're uh, we're expanding our library. I just got a couple new ones in the day or the other day. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and again, thank you to Roushi for sending this over from Germany. Do we have any uh, listener reviews? We do. Week? Okay. The one and only Chris Fold says this is a genre-defining turn-based strategy game, which for me is pure genius, and one I've played for hundreds of hours on the PC. Oh! The Amiga version is 100% complete, but on my stock Amiga 1200 runs terrible. I ended up emulating it on an A4000 where the Geosphere is still an uncomfortable mess. I don't know if it's a lazy port or if it's a point where the Amiga CPUs are just not quick enough, but I lost a lot of enjoyment due to the slow speed. Game is 10 out of 10. This version is sadly a 7 out of 10. Yeah. Graham W. Webke says, I really wanted to love this game. It's one of the classic essential DOS games like Warcraft 2 and Civilization, but I think the Amiga was truly challenged with this. The disc loading would have been painful. Thankfully, ADFs improved the performance, but the disc swapping was way too frequent. Yeah. The music, I think, is better on the Amiga, but some background art and interface yeah. colors look drab. The core gameplay is still there, so if you have patience, there is still a great game here to play. But the DOS version wins. You said the same thing about the graphics. Mm-hmm. You, you you commented on that they instantly. Just, yeah, it's a little high, a little higher quality. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 minor, but it is higher. Yeah. Uh, and Leif Kilon says one of my all time favorite games on any platform. I didn't get to play it back in the day, but bought it the moment the PC version hit the GOG store. I expected an old fashioned, difficult, and unintuitive game, but found it anything but. It's instantly gripping. The geoscape and the grand strategy that it offers is rewarding and just deep enough not to get boring, and the tactical battlescape, the result of a decade of refinement on Gollop's part at this point, is intuitive, exciting, and deeply atmospheric. A classic that was still breathtakingly good when I first played it in 2012. 10 out of 10. So... Lots of great reviews, and remember, if you are a Patreon supporter of the show, you get access to our Discord channel, and you can post your own review to be read live on the air. This one, this one, I we didn't go into much about base building and stuff. I mean, there's a whole other separate. Like I built some bases, mm-hmm. but I mean, holy smokes! And you're more, you love that stuff. No, I mean, no, I mean, I mean, you love like Sim City and yes, stuff like but that. that's totally different I mean, kind of game. Well, this. I mean, you still have to have you have to use some knowledge. You have to use your space well, which yeah. I'm not good at that. Mm-hmm. Horrible, but I mean, like I said, the game, eh, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. yeah. All right, Aaron, I would like to thank. Oh, you know what? Why don't we talk a little bit? You you wanted to talk about the Germans? Oh yeah, let's let's talk about that real quick. So. Um, this is where Aaron goes on his ethnic rant. No, I love. <laughs> listen, don't say that. You know, I love. I love the Germans. So, uh, some of you may remember. I guess it's been a couple months ago. I ended up getting a large haul of computer stuff from a guy in St. Albans, West Virginia, and I'd gotten it strictly to get that Amiga One Thousand mission accomplished. By the way, but amongst the things I got, and I did an unboxing on live. If you haven't seen, it, if you want to catch it. Uh, among amongst the things I got was this odd, unusual external uh, Commodore CBM hard drive. Now, when I, I did the unboxing, uh, people in the chat room seemed to think this thing was a pretty valuable item. And uh, you know, we're not C64 guys, although we're working on it. We are. Um, so I thought, well, this is something I don't need. I'll never use. I'm going to sell this thing and try to recoup some of the money I spent on this lot. And lo and behold, the auction, uh, and you know, a lot of people won't tell you what stuff goes for, but I'm, I'll, I'll disclose it right well, it's now. Well, it was also posted for everyone yeah, to see I on know. Facebook. A lot, a lot of people wouldn't know that or wouldn't do that, but it was mm-hmm. ended up going for over 1300 bucks. This, this external drive did. I thought to myself, my God. So the fellow that bought it was a German, and he told me that he'd added up the cost of having this shipped to Germany and all the headaches it would cause. And so uh, he decided that he would use this as an excuse to take a trip. So he and his uh, girlfriend uh, hopped on a plane, and they flew into New York, and they rented a car, and they took the back roads 
from New York City down through Philly and through Washington, D.C., and all the way to Hurricane West Virginia at my house. And uh, me and Boat was there for the occasion. They're both big Amiga and uh, uh, Commodore fans. And so we sat down and did about a 20-minute interview with the two of them. And they are great, real super nice uh, uh, people. In fact, after the interview, I, I hung her out and chatted with them for another couple of hours. They stayed for a good while. That's great. And we chatted. That's great. And it turns out um, this guy has a massive collection of uh, Amiga and Commodore computers and DOS and a bunch of other stuff. He's got a huge collection. And uh, he's the kind of guy that brings stuff to perfection. And then sort of is he he makes everything completely minty fresh and then sort of puts it to the side and he was commenting that his girlfriend uh would always make him not sell it because he she's like you spent all this time on it what are you doing so they've got a huge collection and this fellow also mentions and this surprised me but that he's not really into the scene at all he, he uh, doesn't follow the amiga stuff that much at all so i was kind of surprised by that yeah he's just he's solely in it from a museum curator point of view, where he wants to just amass this collection, which is cool. Yeah. The, one of the great things about this hobby is you can do it any way you want. Yeah. Um, he also mentioned that on his way here, you know, uh, someone just asked where he was from. He mentions that- He's Man the, Mannheim. Was it Mannheim? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Boat. Um, he mentioned that on his way to pick this up, he had managed to locate a second one of these drives, which these things were incredibly rare. And he procured it as well, so he's got two of these things, and he's uh, and he's uh, told me that once he gets a chance to clean and repair these things and bring them back up to speed, he's going to contact me, and hopefully he'll shoot some video or something we can put up. Uh, but he also has a stash of, uh, he's got a stash of a bunch of stuff, but he's got a huge stash of uh, MFM hard drives, new in box. I, you know, talk to me, because you've mentioned that like several times yeah. here lately. I don't know what an MFM hard drive is. You know what a SCSI hard drive is, right? Yep. You know what an IDE hard drive yep. is? Go further back, you've got MFM. Okay, so they're Bigger, like the original older, protocol. Slower. I doubt they were the original. They're very old, mm. and they put out a lot of heat. He also mentioned like me. to me that he has a huge stash, a huge stash in the tube, brand new, never been used, of original SID chips. Wow. He's sitting on a ton of SID chips. Among other things, God only knows what he's got because apparently he he took several truckloads of stuff from a uh, uh, a computer store that had shut down that was a couple hours away. It was a real interesting uh, it was a real interesting uh, conversation we had. So we're going to post this video here in, in, uh, in a week or so. Uh, it should be fun. So if you're into that at all, uh, or if you're, if you're into classic CBM stuff, he also goes into uh, some of the stuff Commodore did before the pet. Uh, which I didn't know much about, so that was pretty interesting. He was very, very knowledgeable, wasn't he, Boat? Yeah, and very a smart guy. Real nice guy. A real huge nice guns. guy. Huge guns. He was huge. He was. He was. Yeah. Probably, would you say he was six three, six four? Six three, twenty four inch python. He was a. He was a big guy. Yeah. And uh, something else they mentioned is that they both work in entertainment. Uh, he is a art uh, audio engineer mm -hmm. for films, TV, and she is a. Uh, video engineer, a camera person for mostly TV. Oh, yeah. So I don't think they mentioned that yeah. on the interview. That must have been in your chat later. Yeah, so that was, cool. that was that yeah. was that was kind of neat. They're both in the entertainment industry. So anyway, I thought this was fun. Uh, I did talk to him uh, yesterday. He was preparing to get on the plane in New York, and he told me that uh, he had measured and weighed everything, and he should be able to get this thing in his bag. Wow! To put on the it's in, the on ultimate carry on. And he said he the whole time the whole trip back on West Virginia roads and stuff. He was worried that he had that thing secured so it couldn't <laughs> bounce around. You so, got to be. You got to secure that stuff on West Virginia. It roads. was fun. But so one thing this proves is that people from Europe can travel to Hurricane. That's so right. So I expect a parade of you guys to start coming over here to hang out uh, in the arcade and have yourself interviewed. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. But yeah, thanks for them for coming over, and it worked out great. We had a lot of fun. All right. I want to thank all of the fine folks that are watching us live right now. We, we record this show live every week on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Amigos Retro Gaming. Um, I want to thank Tanner Mirabel, Pixels at Dawn Gaming, Tinfoil, uh, Edvin Helen Picard 2010 L Curtis B the Retro Man Cave. Uh, let's see who else bark bit in the house. 
Uh, Sjordbjorn L. One day I'll learn how to say that name correctly. Ricky DeRocher is here. Graham Bebke. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us this evening. Um, and uh, Paul Kitching is here too. Um, and I want to, if you are a Twitch watcher and you would like to support the show, you can subscribe to us on Twitch. Uh, this is just like all these people. Uh, tapes from the Crypt, Math Dufort, G Vebke, Muggy7, 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, The Slow Norris, Chris Folds, Anguish Auteur, Brutal Barracuda, Macintosh Librarian, Hasifa, 6MMBRX, I am Paul H, Mohawk Mall, Bumface Poo Hands, Silver Streak 72, Roush EMX, Brother Bill, Paku Takete, Midgard 73, and Still Adolescing. Thank you for subscribing to us on Twitch. And last week's Patreon supporter song, Aaron. Do you remember it? No. I try to close those out instantly as soon as the show's over. Well, you I don't know, want to be like a raving madman in a padded cell. It was uh, it was a little Stevie Wonder. Is that what that was? Yeah, it was a little Stevie Wonder. Yeah, it was originally his name, Little Stevie Wonder. It's funny. He, poor Stevie has the inability to, to see, you know. And, uh, and I've heard that. Ironically, you have the inability to sing. We should join up. No. Ebony and I. Uh, I could do it. Stevie, if he could, call me. If he Paul's ever, getting old. If he would ever pound someone into the sand... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he could, even without the gift of sight, just auditory, he could come over and, p- and pound you down. The song was, You Are the Sunshine of My Life. That's what that was? Oh, yeah, it was. Wow. And I want to thank Man, I was um, way off on that one. Paul Kitching got that one right. And Paul, Paul buddy. And Pac, Double the dose. And Pac Billy. Pac oh, Billy, of Pac course. Pac Billy, of course. Musical savant. He likes to put in a little bit of trivia. He says, This week's song is You Are the Sunshine of My Life by Stevie Wonder from his 1972 album Talking Book which also features Superstition. A great album, but my favorite is Inner Visions, which came out the following year. My favorite is Music of My Mind. Um, and he says this song also features the Fender Rhodes. You know what that is? It's a, uh, it's a guitar. It's the, no, it's an organ. Oh. But you were close, which may be my favorite musical instrument of all time. So, this week's is going to be interesting. Okay? I chose this as you were sitting down for the show tonight and typed it in. <clears throat> It's a sound of the season. Okay, here we go. I earn Wolf Bjorn Vinnun and Terry Howard Reflection Simon Lech Captain Crispy Kilobytes and Caffeine Mike W Deckard Three Point Gary Heather Free Lunch Kate Fox David Pickford Cameron Armstrong Andy Jones Lobster and Nader Craig McClellan Ten Minute Amiga Retrocast Bernard Quinn Retro Man Cave Tim Drew Simon Rose Joseph Harrison Kyle Etcher Robbo Hera Howard Nibs Matthew Lara Moore Andy Craig Sean Zo Darren Low, Max Fallen, 419, Mark Bit, Roland Burke, Andrew Monk, Show the Zombie, John Cook, Leaf Kellant, Alan Kebab, Sorry, Lay Mean Leif, Checote Level, Lord John Marshall, Matthew Perron, Ricky DeRosha, Creepy Dead Boy, Figure CTZ, The Slow Norris, Stefan Sorgon, Mortensen, Edvin Helen, Blindo 75, Christopher Hassel, Ravi Abbott, Chris Foles, Dream Catch of the Lauren Giroux, Graham Vebke Lane, Denson, Adam Battersby, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Gary Huck, C. Brian Jones, Paul Harrington, Duncan Styles, Tapes from the Crypt, Josh Nan, Adam Bradley, Jonas Rulo, THT, Eric Nelson, Kim, Tommy Homich, Chad Daniel, Binks to Brutal Barracuda, Darren Coles, Jason Warren, Spix is on, and Kill Bjorn Barman. Well, that shot Christmas. <laughs> My God. I think you mean made Christmas. It- if Santa ever put anyone on the naughty list, <laughs> there you go, Santa. Cold this sucker up. We're in cold country. He needs to put you in one of those piles I ride a bike up and down. Horrible. If you know the answer, email me, john at amigospodcast.com, and I will announce you as a winner on a next week's show. Next week, speaking of next week's show, Aaron. It's not just any ordinary show, is no, it? No. Uh, for it's the, time for your carols. For the... For the <laughs> Run! <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole show of Christmas carols. Oh, man. Sung in the style That'd be the, the last Patreons. episode of Movie He Gets right there. I can tell you that right now. Um, so next week, we're actually going to do something we've never done before. It's our it's our Christmas Spectacular, our fifth Christmas Spectacular. Yes. 
Um, and we're going to and we're going to actually cover all the Elvira games. No, I was kidding. Um, we're going to do a all demo show. So we're going to open up the show. Uh, we're going to record a short audio uh, portion of the show, and then we're going to actually just kick back. We're going to watch some demos. We're going to chat with the with the with the chat. We're going to open up the phone lines. Let you guys call in if you want to on the Discord. Um, and uh, chat with us about what you got going on at Christmas. And we're going to have some giveaways. Uh, Jonas, uh, a.k.a. O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, has hooked us up with some sweet uh, Amiga-related giveaways that we'll be passing out on the show. So uh, please join us next week live, if you can, over on Twitch. Uh, we'd love to have you. And um, the week after that, of course, is our... Uh, annual stupid hat event stupid hat event where we do the listener choice awards which i also want to remind you if you've not yet done so please vote at vote.amigospodcast.com do it right now before you forget vote.amigospodcast.com uh choose the game of the year and all your favorite or not so favorite games of the games that we've covered this year on amigos we will be revealing those results on our final show of the year. How's the voting looking so far, Boat? We've got about 50, 50 re, uh, responders so That's far. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Remember the first time we did that, we had like, what, eight? I think it was you and me and Brent. I think that was it. That was, on, so, on the flip side, those are some great games. That's here. true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Get a little action now. You know, maybe I can hold my, remember my Christmas memories contest? That I, had, oh, no, no, oh, yeah. I had a couple of pity entries. Maybe I can put that back together and get at least 10. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Never again. <laughs> Never get participation ever. That's right. All right, guys. Thanks for listening as always. And we will see you next week. Until then. Adios. adios.